Tuesday morning. It's Tuesday, November the 2nd, and it was good to see another morning, a pretty day today. I think it's going to be a nice day, this nice weather. Um, I got a good night's rest last night, and I plan to get a good night's rest tonight as well, even though the Braves are playing. I think I'll make a choice to find out who won the game Wednesday morning rather than staying up late tonight, so we'll see how well that works out. A few prayer requests I want to make you aware of that you're not familiar with. Of course, we're continuing to pray for Constantine and and Vanessa and their treatments of cancer. But um, got word yesterday that Gene Yance is going to be having sh shoulder surgery tomorrow. I'm not sure how extensive that surgery is going to be, but uh, she will be having that. Kevin, we're glad to know that, that uh, your knee uh, was not a bad situation, but just a little rest and ice and elevation is going to take care of that. And then a, 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 a real um, a critical matter, Jonathan Crow, who is Sharon Head's son. Actually, Jonathan is my second cousin. Uh, Sharon's my first cousin. Many of you know her. Uh, he will be having brain surgery tomorrow. He has a tumor in his brain that they're going to be removing. So be praying for Jonathan. Uh, that's tomorrow. His name's Jonathan Crow. Pray for him and that. And um, we'll uh, just trust God to, to his hand to be on that and heal him. But this morning I began reading in John chapter 11, of course, which is the, the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And a um, song that came to my mind as I was meditating on the passage. And so many thoughts flooded my, my heart and mind as I was reading through that passage. And more than what we'll be able to get in today and tomorrow. I'm going to break the passage in two parts, but um, the old the old song, His Eye is on the Sparrow, and just, uh, just reflect on this song as we're thinking of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and the reality that, uh, that His eye, if it's on the sparrow, then we know that it's on us. So. Why should I feel to scare me is on the 
and I know He watches. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches. I sing because I'm happy. Let's sing it out. I know you watch it. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches. Wash in my heart. Heavy. Why should I be discouraged? It was an uplifting song for me this morning because I don't know why. Maybe it's the fall weather. Uh, maybe it's tiredness. Who knows? But I, I just kind of woke up feeling a little bit, a little bit blue this morning, and just meditating on that and thinking um, as we see the story unfold with Lazarus that sometimes it it may seem gloom, sometimes it may seem hopeless, sometimes we are in despair, but we've got to remember that that God is always at work. Um, it, it It's never finalized in God's plan because God has an eternal perspective. We have an earthly perspective. We have a perspective that's in the time limits of of where we live, but God is outside of time. And God always is working, and God always has a plan. John records now for us the seventh miracle sign of Jesus, and it's, it's the longest narrative of any of the miracle signs that he performed. But we've got to keep in mind that every time Jesus performed a miracle, it was not for um, the, the point of mesmerizing people or fascinating them at God's power. Uh, God has already displayed that in his creation and how he holds all things together. But it was to demonstrate, to affirm, number one, that, that Jesus was in fact the Son of God, that he was sent by the Father, that he and the Father are one, that Jesus was God and all of the attributes that, that are recorded in Scripture of the Father are also recorded in Scripture of the Son. And so anything you see Jesus doing uh, it's in the keeping of the nature and character and the power of God. And it was also um, to, to cause those and us as well uh, to, to see the provision that God had made through Jesus. Now, this particular miracle uh, where he raises Lazarus from the dead is to show that Jesus has power over death and life, and he is the resurrection and the life and that in him there's hope for eternity. And so the narrative begins to pick up in verse 1 of chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This is the same Martha and Mary that we read of the account where, where Mary was busy, uh, Martha was busying herself around the house while Mary was sitting at Lazarus, uh, Jesus' feet. And he says in verse 2, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with anoint with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. You remember that story where she took the expensive perfume and she anointed Jesus' feet with that oil and wiped his feet, cleaned his feet with her hair. This is the same family. Lazarus was a brother and he was ill. So the sister said to him, sent to him, sent to Jesus, saying, um, uh, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And evidently, Jesus had a very close earthly relationship with Lazarus. And he's considered here as one that Jesus loved. They were, they were close, I think, in human terms as well. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, 
that can be a little bit confusing because we know that Lazarus did die physically, but Jesus again was seeing beyond that. It was not it was not an eternal state of death because Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the Father. I asked the question this morning as I was reading this, did Jesus know this all along or did the Father reveal it to him at the moment? Well, I'm not sure, uh, but it seems as though all of a sudden Jesus realizes that this, this death that Lazarus is going to face is not, is not the eternal death. It's not forever death, but that Jesus was going to physically raise him from the dead. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, that's ironic. He stays there two days in, in the place where he was after he had learned that Lazarus was ill. Now, naturally, you'd think that the moment he had heard that Lazarus was ill, he would have immediately gotten up and gone to where Lazarus was. Um, but he knew the plans that he had for him, and Lazarus had to die in order for Jesus to perform the miracle that he was going to perform. And I, I meditated on this and thought about it, that in, in, in our lives, sometimes God has to allow things to die in our life in order for him to do what he's going to do. And you can apply that to a lot of situations. Sometimes it can be a job. Sometimes it can be a relationship. Whatever it might be, there are times that that in order for us to see God, to see the reality of God, he has to allow something to die in our lives so that he might perform a greater work and miracle, not again so that we could be mesmerized by the miracle, but that he's working in and through us in those situations in our life. And so you may be experiencing the death of something in your life today. But I want you to be encouraged that we know that, that God always has a plan. God doesn't uh, change plans all of a sudden because of circumstances, because he controls all things. He is sovereign over all things. And in that death of whatever it might be, God has a plan and he's working it out. And he's still uh, concerned about conforming us to the likeness of Christ, working in and through us in those circumstances. And so then, uh, after two days, he says to his disciples, uh, let's go again to Ju Judea. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? You remember last uh, yesterday we saw in John chapter 10, where they were taking up stones to kill him, because he, has, he had, in their eyes, had blasphemed God, and had made himself equal to God, had declared that he was God. And for that reason, the Pharisees were going to stone him. And so his disciples are saying, hey, we just escaped there. They were trying to stone you, Jesus. And I wonder if they may have had a little bit of their own interest in mind, because they knew that they were recognized as followers of Christ. And if Jesus was going to be stoned, odds were they were too. And so they say to Jesus, Jesus, they were just trying to kill you. Are you, are you, are you crazy? Are you nuts? Are you going back there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And here Jesus is making reference again to the fact that, that he is the light of the world. And so if anyone walks in him, they're not going to stumble. But when we walk in darkness, uh, which is the opposite of, of that, then odds are we're going to probably stumble. And verse 11, after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Notice he didn't at first say that he had died. And then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking a rest and was sleeping. And so here again, I think they're trying to get out of going to the place in Judea where uh, the Pharisees were trying to stone Jesus. And they said, hey, if he's, if he's sleeping, he's going to get rest and, and he'll be okay. But Jesus was really talking about his death. And then he told them plainly, just laid it out on the line. Listen, guys, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. You see, uh, perhaps in God's plan, it was for the sake of those disciples and the others that would be there. 
that they would see Jesus' power displayed and that he is the resurrection and the life, that he has power over death. And so um, he, uh, he says, for your sake, I'm glad that he's dead so that you might see the work that I'm about to do. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, this is the same Thomas that we see after Jesus' resurrection. We call him Doubting Thomas. And Thomas said, you know, I'll not believe that he's, that he's raised from the dead until I put my hand in, in his hand and feel the piercing where the nails were in his side. And so I, I love this. <laughs> I kind of hear the sarcasm in Thomas's. Hey, if he's going, let us go with him so we can die as well. I just love how candid scripture is. Now in verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So Lazarus had been dead for four days when Jesus arrived. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off to the west of Jerusalem. And many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brothers, uh, concerning their brother, his death. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now, Martha gets a lot of criticism because of the account of, uh, that's recorded in Scripture of she and Mary. And Martha was busied about all kinds of matters that did, really didn't matter. And Mary was, uh, was concerned about the thing that most mattered, Jesus said, and that was sitting at his feet. But here we see it's Mary this time that remains at the house, and it's Martha that goes out to meet him. And then, and then Martha says, I know that whatever you ask of the Father, he will do. Uh, I think in Martha's mind, she had here the fact that Jesus had the power to, to raise Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She believed in the resurrection just like the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. And uh, in verse 28, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now here in verse 25, we see Jesus using that personal pronoun of God, I am. It was this usage of that phrase is why the Pharisees wanted to stone him. They wanted to kill him because in that, he used the same name that God used when he told Moses who he was, I am Yahweh. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, physically though he die, he will live for all of eternity. And we have that hope in Christ that, uh, that though we may face death on this side, and we never know what day that's going to be, uh, the Bible tells us very clearly that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we will live forever in eternity with him, but only if we've placed our trust in the resurrected Christ. And so today, I want to encourage you that if you're watching and you've never placed your trust in Christ, you're trusting in him for paying the price and the penalty for your sins and believe that he died on the cross and that he rose again on the third day. If you've never placed your trust in that, you're hoping that, I want to encourage you to do that today. That is the only way to see eternal life is through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And he declared that life is only found in him. Martha, in the story, professed and believed that he was the Messiah, the one that was sent. Have you done that? If you have, then praise God for it today. Give him glory that he has saved you. Not that you saved yourself or you did anything to save you, but in his grace, he called you and he saved you. And in that, 
Pray that God would give you a desire to see others come to know Christ and have the hope of eternal life. This world today needs hope. The only hope that we have, the only hope that this country has, the only hope that the world has, is not found in politicians, it's not found in political parties, it's not, it's not found in powerful corporation, but the only hope that we have is Jesus Christ. So pray and ask God, God, give me an opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart today. God, if, if the seed has been planted, God, give me wisdom and discernment to know how to cultivate that seed. And God, I, use me today to help lead someone to faith and trust in Christ. I well, pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you. We'll pick up tomorrow with the rest of the story. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. Remember, tomorrow night is our corporate prayer, first and foremost, at 6 p.m. in the Children's Center. I encourage you to come together and pray with the body. Uh, we believe strongly in prayer here at First Conyers. We know that only God can build his church. Only God can make disciples. He uses us to do it. But we've got to call on God. Uh, to do that work that only he can do. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a great day.